Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first event for graduate forum from Indian Archaeology. From our part, from the organizational committee, we'd like to thank you. Ah, sorry. We'd like to thank you and welcome you all today at the Archaeological Research Unit. We're a bit late, five minutes late, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you, uh, Professor Stella Domestica, uh, for a small, for a really short hello. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Dear guests, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of History and Archaeology, it, my, it is my distinct honor and great pleasure to welcome you all to the first graduate forum for Mediterranean archaeology, a dynamic initiative of our postgraduate students that brought together young archaeologists from across Europe. FOMAR, as it is abbreviated, is supported by the Department of History and Archaeology and the Archaeological Research Unit. And I have to explain that all archaeologists at the University of Cyprus will wear two hats. We teach at the Department of History and Archaeology and we conduct our research at uh, the Archaeological Research Unit here, which is our professional home at the university. Our department was established in 1996. Since then, the vision of its members has been to develop a distinguished center for the study of history and archaeology of Cyprus within its wider Mediterranean, European, and Middle Eastern contexts. Furthermore, the department is actively engaged in the efforts for the preservation and valorization of the island's rich cultural heritage, always in close collaboration with the Department of Antiquities, other governmental institutions, private cultural foundations, and not least the local communities. Our ambition is to train tomorrow's scholars, both in the classroom and in the field, furnishing them with the necessary methodological tools and background knowledge for a successful career in the world of uh, culture and education. Above all else, the department focuses on instilling core ethical values, stimulating critical thinking and sparing creativity as a way to contribute meaningfully to scientific, social, and cultural advancements in today's globalized world. Networking and internationalization are among the strategic goals of our university and the Department of History and Archaeology in particular. The members of our academic and research staff carry out research in Cyprus and abroad, which often involves coordinating or taking part in major European and international research projects. Our undergraduate courses are taught in Greek, but we make sure to include classes in English every semester so that students from all over Europe can profit of the opportunities offered by the Erasmus program, as well as the UFE Alliance, the network of young universities from the future of Europe, of which our university is a partner. In this way, we encourage students to expose themselves to an international academic environment and develop intercultural skills that are highly valued in the European family. Our eight master's programs cover diverse interdisciplinary subjects varying from Byzantine studies and the Latin East to conservation and restoration of historic buildings and sites. Two of them are taught in English and attract mainly international students. One is in field archaeology on land and under the sea, and the other in digital heritage and landscape archaeology. Our PhD program in Mediterranean archaeology is one of the four offered by our department, and it's most successful and plays a key role in our research strategy. The present conference showcases the best way how our students share our vision and place dynamically the studies at our university in their Mediterranean context. In the conference program, I counted 22 universities and research institutions from 11 different countries, 
and in front of such an audience, I do not need to reiterate the importance of exchanging academic experiences and ideas across cultures and borders. The pandemic certainly brought to the fore the, important, the importance of meeting in person as well, something that we wouldn't even think of pointing out three years ago. So without further ado, I congratulate the organizers for their inspiring initiative and my colleague, Athanasius Vioni, the director of the Archaeological Research Unit for his indefatigable support. I wish you all an engaging, stimulating and successful conference. Dear students and PhD candidates, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen in Cyprus and abroad, on behalf of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus, I have the great pleasure and honor to welcome you to the first international meeting of the Graduate Forum for Mediterranean Archaeology or FOMAC. A few months ago, a group of doctoral candidates and MA students of archaeology at the University of Cyprus, namely Thodoris Vasiliou, Mirto Kalafonu, Misan Kopnar, Panos Diamandopoulos, Sabina Hajipadeli, and the Lupita Rabitou, members of the 2022 organizing committee, took the initiative to establish FOMARC as a forum through which the archaeological postgraduate community of the University of Cyprus, engaging in different archaeological research fields, can share their research with their peers from Cyprus and other countries, focusing on the Mediterranean region. The Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus has been by their side since then, since the conception of the idea, and has the privilege of hosting and actively supporting this new series of biennial conferences in a hybrid form uh, in our premises in Nicosia, allowing all attendees and the speakers of the 51 oral poster presentations to engage in fruitful discussions and debates. In these times, calling for social relevance of scientific research and public outreach, it is very fortunate to see an overwhelming number of fascinating research papers by young researchers from Europe and the Near East, across chronological phases, geographical regions in the Mediterranean and scientific fields being presented to the framework of this conference. Facing an ever-growing trust of everything inter- and cross-disciplinary, the vigorously growing collaborations in the field of archaeology have proved beneficial for all to better approach and understand human society um, from early prehistory to the recent past. This interdisciplinarity and variety of approaches, topics and periods is certainly imprinted in the program of this conference. Closing the short welcoming speech, I would like to express my most sincere congratulations to the organizing committee and my gratitude to the ARE technician, Constantinos Prastitis, and our secretary, Lisa Grigoriou, as well as to all volunteers of this conference who have directly or indirectly supported it, its success. The committee has organized a vibrant scientific program and has been working hard to include as many fields of research and chronological periods as possible, covering numerous regions across the Mediterranean. I wish you all a delightful and stimulating two days and a productive conference with exciting and encouraging discussions and exchange of knowledge so that together we can anticipate a future of groundbreaking knowledge and research on the human past by a young and vibrant community of research in archaeology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, um, Professor Demes and Professor Leonis, for your nice words. Now, we'd like to invite uh, Professor Gorita to for our keynote speaker for our keynote speech today. Thank you. I don't know. Oh, okay. Perfect. Good morning, wherever you are or good evening, as the case may be. So in looking over the conference program, I realized that the pendulum in the study of Cypriot archeology span seems finally to have swung from prehistory and proto-history, including the late Bronze Age, to later periods, uh, a long overdue development. A suite of recent publications, both in the form of articles and monographs, focus on the Iron Age, the late antiquity, the Byzantine and medieval periods. 
And it's gratifying to see in these studies that many take their cue, or at least some of it, from studies on prehistory, which have dominated the field ever since I entered it. Uh, speaking more locally, uh, this swing of the pendulum certainly has a lot to do with the uh, program in archaeology here at the University of Cyprus uh, and uh, the work of Dr. Uh, Athanasios Dionis, the director of the ARU, and his students. Finally, uh, in a preliminary way, I want to mention that over the past few years, we have lost two of the best known, widely published and highly respected archeologists in Cypriot prehistory, Edgar Peltenberg and Vasos Kariargas. One cannot really do Cypriot archeology span without constant reference to their fieldwork, research and publications. For entirely different reasons, I owe both of them a great debt, and so dedicate this talk today to their memory. Now, as research students, you might wonder where archeologists come up with ideas for new papers beyond materials recovered in survey or excavated from in the field. In this case, there were two factors, an email exchange, between two senior scholars, neither of them me, not working. It's right. Okay, so as I was saying, in this case, the idea for the paper um, came, there were two factors, an email exchange between two senior scholars, neither of them me, uh, and whose names shall remain anonymous no matter how much bad for me, and second, an unpublished paper given at the 2020 POCA conference here in Nicosia. Here is the key point of the email exchange. Uh, the, just note the highlighted in yellow uh, section. And the particular quote was, it is on Cyprus that particularly in the 13th century, one can plausibly conjecture that the greatest political power resided firmly in the hands of maritime, mercantile elites. Senior scholar number one in his email says, if this is true, then I would ask, where are the great houses of those elites, such as the four merchant houses with their archives that have been excavated in Ugarit? Why is Cyprus so different? The response from senior scholar two is, in Ugarit, we have texts indicating the mercantile use of structures, whereas in Cyprus, we don't. Now, senior scholar one asks a good question, but it's obvious from the tone, they don't believe Cyprus had such merchant houses and in any case was so different. The response from senior scholar number two shows two things. First, they believe that only texts can identify merchants. So the rest of that message is irrelevant. Second, they don't know anything about Cypriot archaeology. Taken together, these two messages annoyed me so much that I decided rather than responding, I'd write an article to challenge their beliefs. About the same time, I read the following paper presented at the POCA 2020 conference. Today, you'll hear a similar paper from Enrico regarding material from the Marfa Bay region. In his earlier paper assessing the context and function of weights and related materials within and beyond late Bronze Age Cyprus, 
Enrico presented a great deal of material and context that I felt were directly relevant to the issue of merchants on late Bronze Age ciphers. Finally, to make another point about research students, the paper on which this uh, lecture is based was co-authored with Nathan Meyer, a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology of UC Berkeley, and has now been accepted for publication in the American Journal of Archaeology, where it will appear in the April 2023 issue. So if you miss out something today, you can catch up on it then. So on to today's talk in which I examine the emergence and role uh, of merchants on late Bronze Age sites. I present various settlement remains, houses, burials, and so on, that may reflect the presence or daily practices of merchants. And I discuss how objects like weights, scales, seals, and writing implements, when found together, may signal links to merchants or mercantile practices. I consider the role of elites and elite conflict in establishing the organization of copper production. And I ask whether a merchant class evolved out of existing elites or from the entry of new economically powerful social actors. Finally, I argue that a new economic class, the merchant, was in the process of formation throughout the late Cypriot period from about 1650 to 1100 BC. The people of late Bronze Age Cyprus were trying to engage dynamically with the economic systems of the wider contemporary Levantine and Mediterranean worlds. Driven by the external demand for copper, the people of the island nonetheless retained the productive agro-pastoral base that had underpinned its economy for millennia. Increasingly, however, the economy became more diversified, but at the same time more integrated, industrial in nature, and town center. Thus, the political economy of the late Bronze Age was characterized by intensified copper production and distribution, driven by externally oriented urbanized settlements that emerged along the island's eastern and southern coasts. The involvement of Cyprus in the inter international exchange systems of the late Bronze Eastern Mediterranean is clearly attested in contemporary cuneiform documents from Ugara and Mari in Syria, Tel El Amarna in Egypt, and Hittite Anatolia. <clears throat> Overseas trade can be traced on Cyprus in the growing number of luxury imports, ivory, gold, faience, often found in mortuary contexts. Beyond raw material exports like copper or timber, Cyprus shipped pottery in ever increasing amounts to the Levant, Egypt, Anatolia, and the Aegean. With this brief background in view, I now want to present some broader issues related to merchants and mercantilism within and beyond Late Bronze Age Cyprus then narrow the focus to examine the archaeological data relevant to those issues. So, merchants and mercantilism. The mercantile and maritime potential, as well as the social dynamics of late Bronze Age Cypriot ports and complex inland polities may be seen in the availability of both domestic products and imported goods found at sites such as Engomi, Palasultan Teke, Kition, Mariam, Maroni, Ayos Demetrios, and Alasa. As oxide ingots and craft goods produced on Cyprus spread throughout the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, long distance maritime trade became a key component of the Cypriot economy, bringing in other raw materials and exotic imports essential for maintaining the politico ideological system. In her recent paper treating institutional versus private trade, we come back to the quote now that set off this lecture, Scher discuss, discussed how, as the scale of production and exchange intensified, those who already exercised political economic power increasingly sought to monopolize the manufacture, 
and or circulation of certain raw materials and goods on which their social status depended. She suggested that the sources of power in the late Rome's Eastern Mediterranean resided at least as much in the maritime mercantile activity as in agrarian holdings, singling out the site of Ugarit. Above all, Sheriff claimed, and I don't need to repeat this quote now for the third time, uh, that on um, 13th century B, Cyp Cyprus, one uh, can conjecture that the greatest power resided firmly in the hands of mercantile maritime elites. Now, regarding overseas trade, Cyprus not only produced pottery in large numbers, but its merchants also likely controlled the transport and distribution of these wares. The appearance of Cipromanon signs on vessels like Canaanite jars indicates they could have traveled through Cyprus or else were handled by traders familiar with Cypriot traditions. Ferrara and Bell suggest that Cipromanon signs attested on four miniature oxide ingots and by implication, their presence on several full-size copper oxide ingots served as mercantile brands, denoting the origin and quality of Cypriot copper. Equally prominent is the Cypriot industry in Finnish bronze objects, such as the tripod stands. Yahalo Mac et al. even contend that Cypriots were the major players in the broader commercial networks of the late Bronze Age metal trade in the Mediterranean. Sheriff concluded these growing networks of commercial traders and proliferating routes made lasting and effective institutional control of circulating goods and materials virtually impossible. It was above all the relentlessly increasing scale and diversity of geographical and actor involvement together with a rapid entrepreneurial diversification in some regions, such as Cyprus, which led to the loss of centralized control." End quote. How does the archeological record of late Bronze Age Cyprus stack up to such broad brush statements? Where and in what material form might we demonstrate the presence of merchants in late Bronze Age Cyprus? Was the late Cypriot polity hierarchical in makeup? If so, who was at the apex of such a policy or politics? And how did they achieve their prominence? Keep these questions in mind as we proceed to consider the heretofore invisible merchants of Cyprus. In her 1993 paper, Priscilla Keswani first suggested that foreign merchants may have visited and resided in Cyprus's coastal towns, and that foreign market forces may have stimulated the development of the Cypriot copper industry. In a subsequent 1997 paper, Manning and Anita expanded on this notion, arguing that late Bronze Age Cyprus was, and I quote, the home of several contemporary autonomous competing polities, each of which established and maintained independent trade relations with other states of the Mediterranean, end quote. In their view, what was initially, what was initiated largely by foreign trade and foreign merchants became more bilateral over time as Cypriot merchants came into their own. In two papers published in 2012, Heltenberg added a further twist and argued that the political political economy of the island revolved around the institution of networked households, evident in what he called the elite residences at several key late Bronze Age Cypriot sites. Heltenberg suggested that late Bronze Age Cyprus functioned as, quote, a devolved polity with decentralized councils, one whose king enjoyed the limited authority of a great household within the social network of privileged households on the island, end quote. The main role of any such household, of course, would have been to meet foreign demand and to ensure the continuing export of copper, timber, and other local products. In line with our own thinking, 
Heltenberg suggested that a rigid interpretation of late citric society, i.e. as totally centralized or completely regionally based, is too constraining, and that reading textual and material evidence together suggests a dynamic, multifaceted power structure on the island. Whilst these earlier studies set the stage, in our own paper, we considered a wide range of cuneiform documents dealing with mercantile matters, especially the merchants of Ugara. Here, however, I have time only to present textual evidence directly relevant to Cyprus. The only Cypriot king mentioned by name in cuneiform records is the tongue-twisting Kusme Shusha, who reigned toward the end of the 13th century BC. In the Akkadian texts in question from Ugarit, Kusme Shusha hails the king of Ugarit as my son, thus implying the inferior status of Ugarit's rule. We also learn from one letter that Kusme Shusha sent the king of Ugarit as a royal greeting gift 33 copper ingots. These tablets taken together not only confirm the close economic and diplomatic links between Cyprus and Ugarit, but also, one, indicate that Alasha had a bureaucratic system for dealing with mercantile matters, and two, demonstrate the Cypriot king's continuing capacity to produce and distribute copper clearly attested in the Amarna letters dated some 150 years earlier. The corpus of Amarna letters uh, from Alashia frequently refers to commercial and mercantile matters. In EA 39, sent from the king of Alashia to the Egyptian pharaoh, the former states, quote, these men are my merchants, let them go safely and promptly. No one making a claim in your name is to approach my merchants or my ships, end quote. This passage clearly indicates the king of Cyprus wielded some level of economic control over Cypriot merchants and their ships. In EA 35, the king of Alasha comments on several mercantile matters involving messengers who would oversee the exchanges. Regarding point three, on the screen, Peltenberg suggested that the men of my country mentioned there were aggrieved timber merchants who had provided the king of Alasha with goods to ship under his own name, but for which they received no payment. Here we see an influential merchant group closely involved in the affairs of state. In EA 40, the governor of Alasha writes to his counterpart in Egypt, and asked that the Egyptian return the Elashian king's men and ships. Specifically, he says, these men are servants of the king, and no one making a claim in your name is to approach them. Send them back safely and promptly. Both EA 35 and EA 40 demonstrate that messengers filled ambassadorial as well as mercantile roles. This is also made perfectly clear in EA 39, where the king of Alasha states, my brother, let my messengers go promptly and safely. These men are my merchants, end quote. Now, there are several further mentions of Alasha merchants in the documents from Ugarit and Amarna, but I hope the foregoing makes it clear that through his merchants, the king of Alasha sought various prestige goods and raw materials in exchange for copper, timber, and greeting gifts. Now I want to turn to consider a range of material evidence that sheds further lights on the merchants of Cyprus. The contextual association of objects such as weights, scales, cylinder seals, writing styli, and imported goods points to the presence of people involved in mercantile activity. In the paper I mentioned earlier, De Benedictus listed several such contexts within, but also beyond Cyprus, at Megiddo, uh, Ugarit, Ulubaran shipwreck, and so on. More relevant visually is a scene from the tomb of Rechmere, where a man regulates a balance, 
whose two trays hold five ring ring ingots in one and two weights in the other. The same weights in a third hippo-shaped weight lie in a basket at the foot of the balance. Meanwhile, a scribe with a stylus standing beside a basket of ingots records the way. This Egyptian tomb painting portrays well the co-occurrence of weights, a scale, and a stylus in an obviously mercantile context. So we may expect merchant assemblages to be evident in special purpose buildings and individual burials, although other contexts cannot be ruled out. On Cyprus, several sites have produced metal weights. In what follows, however, I consider only those sites with distinctive mortuary deposits, architectural features, and other contexts that contain some or all of the following items. Scales, weights, writing styli, stamp or cylinder seals, and notable numbers of imports. From tomb, from late Cypriot one tomb, 1851 at Enkame, <laughs> come two reported scale pans along with an unusual rock crystal weight. There are other tombs as well as several buildings at Enkame that contain notable numbers of weights and imports, but no scale pans. So they are not considered further here, but should not be discounted as possible relevant context. Excavations in tomb one at Morfu Tumbatuskuru uncovered three balance weights, fragments of several scale pans and three cylinder seals. Some 10 kilometers to the northwest of Tumbatuskuru lay the a coastal site of Ayerini Paleocastro, whose excavations were excavations in tomb two, late Cypriot 1A and date, produced seven weights, fragments of one or two scale pans, two hinge elements, a cylinder seal, and what is reported to be a bronze stylus. And I thank Jennifer Webb for producing and allowing me to use both of these images. Also from late Cypriot 1, Ayerini, tomb 20 contained three apparent weights, fragments of one or more scale pans and a cylinder seal. From burials in tomb three at Ayerini come two sets comprising 11 weights, one possible scale pan fragment, two cylinder seals and three likely bronze styla. In a separate tomb near Ayerini, excavations revealed a bronze scale pan and, uh, and uh, seven balance weights. This concentration of possible merchant burials in the coastal necropolis of Ayerini and in the settlement at Tumba Tuskuru clearly signals the mercantile significance of the island's northwest. As Webb recently observed, the presence of all these items at Ayerini and Tumba Tuskuru suggests that already in the late Cypriot one period, some individuals quote, were clearly conversant with economic practices which involved accurate weights and measures and record keeping within a commercial system common to Egypt, the Levant, and the Aegean. Merchant structures. On the south coast of Ayos Demetrios, from a small hole cut into the floor of room A219, came a set of 14 hematite and bronze weights, as well as a hematite cylinder seal, along with some late halatic 3D pottery. One of the three cylindrical weights, as you can see here, has a textile imprint, which De Benedictus suggested may have been part of a bag used to hold the weight set and cylinder seal. From room two, A204 in the same structure, other, perhaps related finds include a piece of a chain that could have belonged to a scale and a cylindrical object now identified as a metal stylus. The contextual association of all these objects in two interconnected rooms of building three suggests that some of the people who use this structure were involved in mercantile activities. And by the way, the Egyptian tomb painting that I showed you uh, depicts weights very similar to those found 
in building three. Elsewhere at IS Dimitrios, recent work by the CAMBI project has identified two areas of potential interest. Building 16, for one, and the approach to the site's administrative northeast area with its multi-phase monumental constructions. All these impressive structures at IS Dimitrios, including the monumental storage complex of Building 10, suggest urban planning by elite agents. Although there is no direct evidence for mercantile activities here, such structures, in the words of the excavators, were the most visible and permanent materialization of the power of late Cypriot elites." End quote. Some three kilometers south of I.S. Demetrios on the coast, recent survey work and limited excavations of the heavily eroded site of Tukni Latia have revealed a small anchorage that would have uh, served in both internal and external exchange as a link in a coastscape that provided goods to larger ports like nearby Moroni involved in external maritime trade networks. At Moroni itself, the likely sheltered anchorage has now been resurveyed. At least 70 stone anchors have been identified. Unfinished ones like that seen here were evidently being produced at the site. The ceramic assemblage now includes six Canaanite jars and a fragmentary Egyptian Tel El Yahudia juggler. The size and configuration of the anchorage has been reconceptualized, and in a recent paper, Atkins and Manning suggests that Sarukas served, quote, as a dynamic hub of activity for maritime trade, end quote. On land at Sarukas, Building 1 is a relatively large rectilinear structure, some 250 years later than the anchorage. Small rooms open off what may be a courtyard, with semi-ashlar masonry marking entries and exits. Each of the rooms is characterized by small pithoi set in the floor or walls and fragments of others scattered on bases on the floors. The construction elements and internal finds at Building 1 seem consistent with its identification as part of a specialized anchorage and storage area at Moroni. On the West Coast, excavations in Building 2 at Ma Palio Castro late 13th, early 12th centuries BC, uncovered two scale pans, two weights, a steatite stamp seal, as well as faience fragments. Building three, a separate but immediately, uh, immediately adjacent likely storage facility, also produced eight weights, as well as 25 cylinder seal impressed pithos fragments. Sherrod has suggested that sites like Ma may have served mercantile elites who were attempting to establish their own power base. Ma probably functioned as a transport center with resident merchants who lived in Building 2 and used Building 3 for storage, overseeing the movement of imported goods from coast to inland. Excavations in City Quarter 4 at Hala Sultan Teke Bisatja have uncovered well-built walls that incorporate ashlar blocks, which makes this quarter rather distinct from the industrial and domestic structures found in the other city quarters. A corridor within one structure extends at least 20 meters in length. With its numerous pithoi, this space must represent a storage journey. Amongst notable finds were a turquoise faience pendant, several Canaanite jars, some pierced stone weights, a lentoid flask, and an Egyptian jar. With its storage corridor and location closest to the present day Salt Lake at Larnaca, City Quarter 4 likely represents part of the site's harbor district. In earlier work at Hollis of Tanteke, um, in Ostrom's excavated areas. Uh, Ostrom reported on a prominent semi-ashlar structure, Building C, which held a range of imported Mycenaean and Canaanite pottery, lead ingots and plaques, 
a bronze arrowhead and crushed murex shells. Ostrom suggested that Building C might have been a merchant's house. The site at Kityon is situated on a well-protected bay with excellent conditions for a harbor. From Area 2 at Kityon, so-called Temple 1 was built with large ashlar blocks and had a grand ashlar decorated entryway. 19 ships graffiti were engraved on the southern facade of Temple One, which is outlined here in red and the graffiti on the run. Carving ships on the wall of a building may simply point to the importance of landmarks associated with seafaring and trade routes, or it might signal some level of patronage on the part of the building choosers for seafarers. In any case, the significance and elite nature of Area 2 at Kition, including its potential importance for maritime trade, are well known. From so-called Pit 220 in Cartier 4E at Enkami came a cache of metal tools and weapons, two scale pans with chains attached, a bronze zebu-shaped weight, and a cylindrically shaped weight with a handle. Given some confusion in the early publications of Engomi, defining the specific context beyond noting that it was some sort of a pit is problematic, although a bronze workshop was found in the same Cartier 4E. From Couplier Evrete in the southwest, comes an elliptically shaped hematite weight found in well eight, early 12th century BC, along with a cylinder seal and a stamp seal. In well TE3 from the same site, excavations produced a copper alloy weight filled with lead in the shape of a human female head. Cuclia lies at the terminal point of the Diarizos River Valley and likely served as a proto-harbor or anchorage, perhaps at the locality Lourdes. This is substantiated to some extent by the growing number of imports uh, in tomb deposits or wells within the Paphos region, as at Ibretli, and to some extent by the undated cache of some 120 anchors recorded at Kuklia Akni. So that's the basic archeological evidence. The interpretative framework is complex. Uh, and here I have tried to summarize it uh, in its barest uh, uh, manner. We view late Cypriot society as being comprised of, mul of multiple networks. One network involved the ruling elite who exercised economic authority over a significant portion of society's productive capacity. At stake was control over the production of raw materials like copper and timber for off-island exchange. Based largely on the documentary evidence mentioned earlier, this network is assumed to be hierarchical with an apex leader, but also includes factions that vie for power within that network. As the political economy grew in scale, strategies diversified and new networks develop, developed. Within them, new opportunities arose for capital accumulation and resulted in the rising influence of new social roles. Some roles would have fallen to those within the existing elite but we may imagine that other social actors outside the elite were involved in key operations, like, for example, management. The result was first the emergence of different subgroups that functioned differently within society, and second, increased competition for economic authority. This development would have had broader social ramifications. Within late Cypriot society, the predominant form of exchange was productive or perhaps better communal exchange. In addition, there would have been a small but increasingly significant amount of directed 
or reciprocal exchange. In addition, perhaps within the elite network, but particularly between the leader of that network and the rulers of external polities, reciprocal exchange existed in the form of gift giving, i.e. gifts that were accompanied by negotiations regarding their amount and emphasizing the tradition. Over time, however, while royal gift giving persisted, seen clearly in the Amarna letters, a greater portion of exchange became more formally negotiated, that is, for profit. This reciprocal exchange would have been carried out by a small but growing number of private merchants. In the right context, these private merchants engaged in new, repeated forms of social exchange would have solidified as a merchant class. Implicit in the model of regional centers is the assumption that resources like copper ores were equally accessible at the volume needed for bulk export. export. Although controversial, on the basis of lead isotope analysis, Gale and Stos Gale argued that all bulk copper produced on Cyprus after 1400 BC for external trade came from the Apliki mine. Now, if we give any credence to this argument, and I'm not sure that I do, tightly controlled, it suggests that from about 1400 BC onward, there emerged a single tightly controlled source for bulk export copper. At least this accords well with the cuneiform evidence from Lugara and Amarna that points to a single externally facing state centered around the king. This does not mean that regional power was entirely eclipsed. Around the same time, after about 1400 BC, there is widespread evidence for increasing processing of copper ores at several late Cypriot II sites. Nonetheless, agriculturally based urban centers like Calabasas and Moroni appear to have crystallized somewhat later than the coastal sites focused on overseas trade. Thus, it is instructive to look at the tra different trajectories of Enkami on the one hand and Moroni and Calabasos on the other. In Enkami, at the beginning of the 13th century BC, major architectural modifications took place in the so called fortress while multiple ashlar mansions and sanctuaries existed in several areas in the city. Such a configuration points to competitive elites or factions managing a range of production activities, each asserting their status through architectural and mortuary practices. Thus, the consolidated power base of the previous three centuries had become fragmented which means we have a material signature of conflict resolution through the emergence of new functionally different groups deeply involved in the production and distribution of Finnish goods in an overseas trade. At Hala Sultan Teke, moreover, the clear evidence for 14th and 13th century BC metalworking practices seems to have evaporated by the 12th century. This fragmentation of power at Enkami, and perhaps at Sohala Sultan Teke, stands in contrast to the situation at Moroni, where Manning proposed the consolidation of power by a single individual, or perhaps a single household. This consolidation was spatial, as well as politico-economic in nature, since, as Manning argued, the obliteration of earlier tombs would have erased previous social memory. The situation of Moroni then represents the material signature of conflict resolution through the reassertion of power by an earlier elite, now with strengthened control of agricultural production and an increasingly diverse political economy. What might account for the origin of these power struggles and the two disparate forms of conflict resolution seen at Enkami or Hala Sultan Teke and Moroni. 
we suggest it was the development of new forms of economic power resulting from increased intra-island and external trade in the 150 years prior to 1350 BC. Recent detailed archaeometallurgical studies on materials from Enkemi 3, from Area 3 of Enkemi, indicate that already in the, during the 16th to 14th centuries BC, BC, workshops there were producing copper not just for local markets, but for export. At the same time, prestige goods found in mortuary contexts were focused more on imported gold and silver than on locally produced copper alloys, a further indicator that Cyprus was involved in long distance trading networks. The, uh, this view presented by Kaposavas is uh, a legitimate view that we take up, but I have to point out that the slide is somewhat cheating because it's from a late Cypriot II, not a late Cypriot I. Uh, mortuary context. This is also the time of the likely merchant burials attested at both Enkemi and Ayerini. Thus, during late Cypriot I, it would seem that Cypriot merchants and their Levantine counterparts were already engaging, engaged in burgeoning international trade networks. By the mid 14th century BC, Cyprus's export economy had grown, transformed, and diversified. The sophistication of its export economy and an understanding of both shipping logistics and customer needs is indicated by the increasing commercialization of white slip wares, which ultimately resulted in white slip to a sturdy, easily produced bowl that was easily shipped and subsequently found in some significant quantities in the Le Mans. The same is likely true also for base ring and white shaved wares. By the 13th century BC, there is also increased visibility in burial, in burials at least, of locally produced artistically competent bronze artifacts. This trend toward increasingly diversified production, organized in support of mercantile activity, continued to intensify into the later 13th century BC as evidenced by the scale of textile manufacture at Hala Sultan Teke and the development of a new industry in bronze tripods and stands. By this time, therefore, external trade involved not just raw materials, but increasingly finished products. For the Bronze Age merchant, Cyprus provided a major source of copper, whilst its ports offered an ideal location to keep abreast of fluctuations in demand and supply. The market potential of Cypriot ports like Engomi, Hala Sultan Teke, Kition, and Moroni continued to grow as new connections developed, giving merchants access to a variety of people in a range of both domestic and foreign products that helped to ensure the success of their journey. As we have seen, such ports may also have housed local merchants and provided spaces where foreign merchants could shelter and or conduct their business. That is in those structures I discussed above, Ayas Demetrios, Moroni Tsarukas, Ma, Hala Sultan Teke, and Kitio. Private merchants in antiquity held a socially tenuous status and were often regarded as, a, as untrustworthy. The basis for such sentiment is surely founded on the difference between deeply embedded forms of exchange, i.e. communal exchange, where community members have a mutual understanding of its values, um, of the value of its contributions and benefits, and reciprocal exchange, where the merchant is suspected of having an unfair advantage. Previous discussions have also noted the unruliness of seaborne traders in particular, as well as the dual role of institutional agents who were also private traders. Unlike at Ugarit, 
where socially embedded relationships appear to have maintained a stable ruling elite right up to its destruction. On Cyprus, emergent social networks that crystallized around diversified industrial production and increasing overseas trade likely presented a challenge to the ruling elites. To sum up then, private merchants, maritime mercantile elites wielded a great deal of political economic power on 13th century BC Cyprus. The mercantile maritime potential of late Cypriot coastal urban centers, as well as their growth and architectural elaboration are closely related to the expansion of overseas trade and the diversification of internal production within these centers. I asked at the outset whether this new Cypriot merchant class evolved out of existing elites or from the entry of new economically powerful social factors. The most likely answer is both. However, in honoring the historically specific alongside the macro historic, due emphasis must be placed on what is perhaps a singularly Cypriot phenomenon, namely a broad scale island wide social ferment, mixing local and foreign people and ideas, which resulted in a uniquely uh, market driven economy and ultimately the creation of a merchant class. Finally, to return to the exchange of emails that prompted me to undertake the study, to senior scholar one, I would respond first of all that Cyprus is not Ugarit. They did things differently on this island, and we should never expect that the material, social, or economic parameters of one necessarily has anything to do with the other. The merchant houses of this island may not be as grand or text-laden as those from Ugara, but they are here, along with merchant burials, of which we hear little from Ugara. To senior two, senior scholar two, I would also respond that Cyprus is not the Aegean, and that proficiency in Aegean prehistory does not equate with an understanding of Cypriot prehistory. Moreover, Textual evidence is one thing, archeological evidence another. My final word on the subject is this. In a recent paper, Reinhard Jung posited that the well-known traders of late Bronze Age Ugara may be the prototype of the, quote, independent traders of the Iron Age. Late Bronze Age Cyprus, however, represents an equally strong candidate for such a prototype with private merchants operating out of institutionalized households, each with variable networks within and beyond the island. Indeed, the relative prominence of these private merchants may have varied by location across the island. When combined with their differing networks, this factor may well have served as the basis for regionalism on early Iron Age Cyprus perhaps more than the enduring structure, structural realities of the island's geography and geography. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Brennan for accepting to be keynote speaker in our uh, conference, First Formal Mediterranean Archaeology. And we have time for a couple of questions just before the break, if you have any. Okay. Thank you very much again for your speech. And we have 15 minute breaks before our first session. We will be back at 10.30 for the first part of the forum. Thanks so much. Hello.